between Milton Keynes and a pot of yogurt. A pot of yogurt. A pot of yogurt has culture! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Once Upon a Milton Keynes. Over the next hour, you will hear a collection of stories about this new town. This new town with a lot of old tales. There are histories, folklores, urban myths, there's media stories, personal stories. There's an abundance of tales here. But I'm going to start the show with a personal tale, my own personal tale. You see, that joke that I started off with, that was how the very first person that I met in Milton Keynes described the area to me back in 2013 when I first arrived. I was at Madcap or, or Creek Street, some of you might know, in Warburton. And they described this area as having no culture. And I stood there, I heard that, and I thought this is rather odd. Because here am I stood in a beautiful Victorian building, surrounded by other storytellers, poets, musicians, actors, artists, and I'm being told that there's no culture. Hmm. This started to create a mystery in my mind. And after that, I was asked to do several other performances in the area. More and more over the coming months, I was a living history actress at Bletchley Park. I was performing in schools and events, local stories. And eventually, I became the education officer at the City Discovery Centre. My job was to quite simply inform groups, schools, colleges, anybody who wanted to hear about it, businesses, about the history of Milton Keynes, to tell them the stories. And the more I looked, the more stories I found. And I started to realise that other people didn't know these stories. Other people didn't seem to see them there at all. And I thought, why on earth is this? What's going on? Why do people not know the stories? Let's just see. A hand up if you know any stories about the local area. Hand up. So we've got one hand, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so seven people in the room tentatively put their hand up that they might know a story about the local area. Well, that's not a lot when you consider how many of us are in the room. So you've got to be hand up. Okay, eight. I'm not busy listening to you. So I started to, to try and figure out why this was, why all the stories of Milton Keynes seemed to be lost. And then one day I heard it. I heard what was drowning out all the other stories. There is a national narrative that is coming from all of those people that live outside Milton Keynes. And it says this. Milton Keynes is new and therefore cannot have any cultural heritage! I'm not sure that's true. But that seems to be the case of it. And you know that that's the case of it, because you can read that story on the faces and in the reactions of people when you tell them where you live. For instance, a few years ago, I was invited to Buckingham Palace for dinner. We had jelly, it was lovely, uh, but that's another story. And whilst I was there, Prince Philip turned to me and said, oh, where do you live? And I said, Milton Keynes, and he went, Ugh. Why on earth would anybody want to live in Milton Keynes? And there you have it. That summed it up, didn't it? What them out there think of everybody here in Milton Keynes? They think that there's no point, that it's just a concrete jungle. Of course, having been an outsider, I'd heard those stories about the concrete cows and the roundabouts. But it just didn't make sense to me anymore. And so, when the opportunity came up to be able to do a PhD, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. The question was there in front of me. I knew Milton Keynes had a cultural heritage, 
but I didn't understand why people didn't know their own story. And having heard the national narrative saying that we don't have a cultural heritage, and yet hearing the stories that say we do, being a storyteller, I tend to trust the stories. And so I started to think about how I could use storytelling and heritage to help create a better sense of place for residents of the Milton Keynes. Now, I should explain a little bit about storytelling. What I'm doing right now is known as platform storytelling or performance storytelling. But my PhD is looking at using applied storytelling. That's going into the community and using storytelling to create change or to create some social benefit. So this was the hub of what I was going to do. And so thus my project, knowing my Milton Keynes, which spells K-M-M-K. I thought that was quite fun. <laughs> Maybe that was just me. <laughs> And so this is how I am stood here before you today. Over the next uh, few 15 minutes or so, I will tell you some histories. I will tell you some folk tales. I will tell you some urban myths. I will tell you one legend. I will tell you some media stories. And I will tell you some personal stories. But where do we start with all this? Well, why don't we start with what everybody knows about Milton Keynes? the cows and the roundabouts. My cow story is a beautiful story that happened right here in Stony Stratford. You see, about 50 years ago, uh, how many people go to Costa regularly? Quick hands up on the high street. Anybody go to Costa regularly? No, but you know where it is. Some of you. Well, Costa used to be Chippendale Ironmonger, and it used to have a little uh, section of it that was just china and glassware. And uh, so that was a little bit separate from all the rest of the stuff, and you could go for a walk around. Well, one day, a herd of cows were being herded down the high street. This was not an unusual thing at the time. They were being herded down the high street, and one of the cows broke away from its herd, deciding that, well, maybe it was coming up to Christmas. It wanted to get something nice for the in-laws. It popped into Chippendale, into the glass and china section, and trotted around. Now, you've heard about a bull in a china shop. Well, this was a cow in a china shop, right here in Stony Stratford. And I bet you're thinking right now, oh, the catastrophe is going to be smashed. Apparently not. So the shopkeeper said, it was the politest customer that had come in the day. It trotted round, perused, and then simply walked out. <laughs> and carried on with its herd down the high street. And so, not all cows in Milton Keynes are concrete. <laughs> but for those roundabouts. Well, here's where the urban myth comes in. When you look at the plans of Milton Keynes, there is no mention of roundabouts. They weren't on the original ideas. Um, and so what they decided uh, to do was place all the plans out. And they were trying to figure out where, where they were going to put what. And it was long hours, late into the night. There they are, sipping their coffee, slamming down the table, having an argument. And one by one, coffee rings were left <laughs> everywhere. And that is how we ended up with so many members. <laughs> so the urban myth says. But the reality of it was that the Milton Keynes Development Corporation had no role to play in the idea of roundabouts being here. That was a decision made by the county council. The Milton Keynes Development Corporation decided to build the infrastructure first. That's the roadways and laying down the sewage pipes. <coughs> and so, when the county council had to decide how these junctions were going to be navigated, they saw all of these roads with lots of fields around them, and so they called them rural roadways. And the law at the time was that a rural junction had to have a roundabout. And that is why we ended up with so many roundabouts in Milton Keynes. The idea was that they were going to be temporary and replaced with traffic lights. But before we got round to doing that, they'd become a bit of an icon, and so they stayed. But where was the first roundabout? Well, the first roundabout in the new town of Milton Keynes was actually very close by. 
It was between Stony Stratford and Warburton, just by the M1 bridge. So just as you're going now down the Eleanor Road. But where was the very first roundabout? Well, you need to go a lot further back. You have to go back, uh, well, pre-1926. Why do I say pre-1926? Because that was the time that the trams between Stony Stratford and Warburton finished. Because those trams, they were giant things. They took about 100 people. They were the largest trams in the world. And backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards they went. They took the men from Stony Stratford up to Warburton Works in the morning. They would come back at lunchtime so the wives could come and put their hot dinners <laughs> on the tram. The tram would come up, the gentlemen could get their dinners, and then they would take the trains back again. And then they would come back again to pick them up at night. And where did they turn around? Well, just outside the plough. So that roundabout that's at that top of the high street, I tend to think of that as the very first roundabout in the whole area of Milton Keynes. But we were talking about trams, and that leads me to my next story. Odell's is a well-known institution on Stony Stratford High Street, but he hasn't always been there. It was the current Mr. O'Dell's great-grandfather, James O'Dell, who came to Stony Stratford and set up that iron monger set. Now, it is true that a blacksmith has been on that site since the 1400s. But James O'Dell, he set up a shop, and a few days after he opened, a gentleman came in with a circular bit of sign. It had obviously been a sign which somebody had taken down and cut a circle out of, and they took it in, and it said on the back, times two, beveled. James Odell looked at him and said, well, what do you want? I want glass. I want a bit of glass, circular, this size, beveled edge. That's going to cost you. Oh, that's not a problem. I need two of them. What on earth do you want this for? Well, they're the headlights for the tram. Well, James Odell, being a forward-thinking type of chap, he thought, I'll get them done, but I won't just order two, I'll order three. And then if there's an issue, they can come back and I'll have one ready in stock. So that's what he did. He ordered three of them. And if you go down to Odell's to this very day, that third one is still left in stock. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've got the roundabouts and the cows out of the way. We can continue. Milton Keynes has been part of not just local stories, but national stories and global stories. We even have a connection to an old Greek myth. Who here has heard of Theseus and the Minotaur? Mm -hmm. Yes, a few nods going on. For those of you that haven't, I will do a, a quick overview. Theseus was the son of King Aegeus of Athens, and every year, King Aegeus had to send seven boys, or seven young men, and seven young girls over to King Minos in Crete. Now, King Minos, he lived in Knossos. It was their capital city. And that city was built on top of a labyrinth, because in that labyrinth lived the Minotaur. Half man, half bull, a ferocious beast that lived off the flesh of human beings. And that's what those 14 poor souls were said to be. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the Minotaur. Well, Theseus thought to himself, this is no good. I'm going to put a stop to it. And so he signed himself up as one of the young men. He went over there and he defeated the Minotaur whilst capturing the heart of the young princess Ariadne. And then uh, quickly away they went. That's another story, and it gets a little bit more complicated after that point. But we have a connection to that story. You see, when the development corporation were trying to think of a logo, there was a certain logo that appeared all over Nossus. It's a Minoan axe, a double-headed axe. And they decided to use that. Has anybody got any ideas why they would use such a thing? Why would they use something connected to a city far, far away? Because Knossos, as far as historians and archaeologists know, 
is the very first planned city to be built anywhere in the world. And so using that Manoan axe, they connected Milton Keynes, the last city to be built under the 1946 New Towns Act, with the very first planned city to be built anywhere in the world. And so we have a link with that story. It might be a tenth, <laughs> but it's a link nonetheless. But now for some stories that are of this area. And one of the stories of a hero that comes from around here is a chap who I think is fantastic, who is great. You see, the ground that we walk upon now, if we go way, way back, past the Victorians, past the Normans, past the Anglo-Saxons, even past the Romans, you come to the Iron Age. And at that time, this whole area, parts of Northamptonshire, Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire, and Oxfordshire, were the realm of the Catabalone tribe. And they had a king, a king so famous that even Shakespeare wrote a play about him. There are several dubious facts in Shakespeare's play, but it's a Well, Selenbein, he thought that he was the bee's knees. He called himself Rex Britannicus, the king of Britain when the Romans came over. And he wanted to make good relationships with them. But he had a son. His son's name was Caradoc, or Caradoc, or Caraticus, if you do uh, the Roman. But Caradoc, he didn't trust the Romans whatsoever. And so as soon as they came over in 46 AD, he started to rouse the troops and use guerrilla warfare to beat them back in every way. For eight years, he fought against them. They couldn't get hold of him. But then he decided to stop using guerrilla warfare, leaping out of bushes and surprising them. He thought he would meet them on the field. Now, unfortunately, the Romans, they might not have been very good at defending themselves against surprise attacks, but they were good at field battles and they defeated Caradoc. He fled from the battlefield and he went north to the largest tribe in Britain, which was the Brigantes, because he knew the queen there and he thought he would be safe. And she said, yes, yes, come, we will hide you from those dastardly Romans. But as soon as he crossed the boundary into their territory, they clapped him in irons and handed him over to the Romans. The trail. He was taken to Rome. He was paraded through the streets. Everybody turned out, leering, shouting insults, throwing all manner, not just tomatoes or cushions, <laughs> but other unpleasant things, smelly things. They threw at him, and he took all of this. He was due to be executed for war crimes against the empire. And so he was taken in front of the Senate where he was allowed to have his final words as they decreed his sentence. And so they said, that's it, you're going to be executed, what do you have to say? And he stood there, <coughs> and he looked at them, and he said, you sit there thinking you are great, but let me tell you something. Your greatness is only there because I am such a great hero, because I am such a great adversary. If I had been rubbish, would your victory be as grand? <laughs> and the Romans suddenly realised that he had a point. And the more he drove that point home, the more they realised that, well, if they executed him now, actually, they would be ruining their own reputation. And so they gave him his freedom in an unprecedented move. They made him a free citizen of Rome. He was never allowed to come back to Britain, but he was allowed to live out the rest of his days there in Rome. Doesn't sound too bad, really, when you consider it. So there you have it. Caradoc saved himself with words. And when you think about some of the events that goes on in Stony Stratford with stony words and stony lives, with all sorts of poetry and arts events, maybe that says something about the people of this area, that we've always been quite good with words and something to be proud of. Quick drink. There's only water in 
no stone is shattered with Renee. We've been part of many national narratives. There is Edward I and Eleanor. We now have a beautiful mural down the high street because we now <coughs> no longer have our Eleanor's Cross, which was ruined and, and destroyed during the Civil War. That's another national story. There was Edward IV who met Elizabeth Woodville while he was staying in Stony Stratford. And then a few years later, his son, Edward V, got kidnapped by his uncle, uh, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, later Richard III. These are all parts of the story of this local area. But, and probably you guys will know this, uh, what's, what's the date today? The 3rd of November. The 3rd of November. Um, what's in a couple of days' time? Bonfire night. Bonfire night. Do you know the rhyme? Can you say the rhyme for me? Okay. Remember, remember the 5th of November. So, what story does that link to? Can anybody tell me? Guys, Bork's trying to blow up the king. Yeah, guys, Bork's trying to blow up the king. Did you know that that plot was planned here in Milton Keynes? Newport Tasman, just outside of it, there's a place called Greyhurst Manor, and it was owned by a chap named Sir Everard Digby. What a name that is. You can just imagine him in his doublet. I bet he'd cut a striking figure. So Sir Everard Digby, he was a Catholic, but at the time it didn't do to be an outward uh, proud Catholic. He had to keep things very, very quiet. And even in Gayhurst Manor, he had a secret room where he could practice his Catholic faith. There had been lots of trouble in the previous years. There had been the Reformation under Henry VIII, and then there had been Queen Mary who brought back Catholicism, and then there had been Elizabeth who got rid of it again, and then now we were on James I. And people of the Catholic faith were being prosecuted, and it was causing a lot of unease. Well, Sir Edward believed that it didn't matter what faith you followed. This was Britain, this was England. We should be able to follow whatever faith we chose as long as we were good citizens. Well, this is how come he came to know Guy Fawkes because of that um, Catholic link. And Guy Fawkes needed somewhere to do his plotting, not inside London because he didn't want anybody to catch him at it. And so he went to go and stay at Gayhurst Manor. Well, first, Sir Edward didn't want anything to do with it. It would be a terrible idea trying to blow up Parliament. That was really not the dumb thing. But slowly but surely, Guy Fawkes convinced him that this would be the way that it had to go. So, Sir Edward agreed. And he was going to take part in part of the plan. So Guy Fawkes, he was going to go down to London, he was going to plant all the explosives, and kaboom, that was his job. So Edward's job was, on the day that Parliament got blew, blown up, he was going to go to Worcestershire to go hunting. Oh yes, he was going to have a nice little hunting trip, but actually what he was going to do was ride to the manor where King James's daughter, Elizabeth, was... Um, Staying and he was going to capture her, so they had a bargaining chip. So this was the plan. But of course, we know that that didn't work out. They were betrayed by one of their group, <coughs> and so Guy Fawkes and Sir Edward were arrested, and they were taken to the tower. And just like Guy Fawkes, Sir Edward was tried and found guilty of treason, and he was going to be hung, drawn, and quartered. Well, I don't know how much you know about the hanging, drawing, and quartering of traitors. But they are hung until they are unconscious, not dead. And then they are cut down. Then their bellies are cut open. Their intestines are pulled out, thrown on the fire while they're still attached so they can smell their own insides burning. But then the executioner does something truly terrible. He takes his hand, he shoves it up through the hole, feels around, and pulls out the heart, holds it up to the crowd and says, this is the heart of a traitor! But so the story goes, with his last breath, Sir Edward pushed himself up and said, thou liest! <laughs> and thus he spoke no more. And so still to the end 
of his day. He truly believed he was doing what was right for Britain. But I guess we will never know which way fate would have taken us if they had succeeded. And so, next time you stand around there at the bonfire thinking, oh, pretty fireworks. Now you know that that story is not just a story that happened down in London to people that have got nothing to do with you. That is a story that is part of our history too. But now for something that was also national, but is a bit fun. Who here has heard of Dick Turpin? Yes. <laughs> The Dick Turpin of stories, the Dick Turpin of legend, what a wonderful hero he is. He's not the same Dick Turpin that actually factually lived. He was a terror, a rogue, a murderer, a really unpleasant soul. But the one of legend is the one that we're concerned with, because the one of history didn't come here as far as we know, but the one of legend did. <laughs> you see, as the story goes, he was riding down from Northampton as fast as he possibly could be, chased by pursuers. And until he came screeching in to Stony Stratford. Now, I should point out that this is where the story starts to uh, separate. Because some people say it's the White Horse, and some people say it's the Old Talbot, but he definitely knew a landlord in Stony Stratford. He went running in, and he pleaded for help. We know it was a pub that happened on the Calverton side of the high street because they don't have cellars because that all used to flood. They used to winch their beer up into the roofs. And this is the important bit. Because when Dick Turpin came running in going, you've got to help me, the landlord said, you can't leave Black Bess, <laughs> your famous horse in the stables, and the authorities see that, they're going to know that you are here and I will get in trouble. And then the idea formed. Oh, well, I have got somewhere that we can put both you and Black Bess, which, you, which the authorities would never look for. And so they took out the ropes to winch the beer up with. They wrapped it round Black Bess and <laughs> <laughs> they pulled up that horse. And for the next three days, Black Bess and Dick Turpin hid in the roof <laughs> until the authorities were thoroughly sure that he was nowhere around here and went off. Finally, winch down Black Bess, and Dick Turpin was free to ride and gallop on his way. Now, some say that he went all back north to Northampton, where all the ne'er do wells live. <laughs> and some say that he carried further on down because there is another Dick Turpin story in the area. And again, some people say that it happened at the Old Swan in Loughton, some people say that it was the Old Swan in Wifton on the Green. But definitely happened in one of those, we're sure, because it's a story. And so what happened was he was being pursued again by the authorities. Really, maybe he should have found a better job. He was riding down very quickly. He leapt off his horse. He went in to go and see the landlord. And he said, you've got to help me. I'm in trouble. They're chasing me. And so the landlord said, well, I can't help you, but I've got a friend who has. Just opposite, there was the blacksmith, and the blacksmith popped over, popped off Black Bess's shoes, turned them round the other way, popped them back on, and off went Dick Turpin, riding as fast as he could. So when the authorities came, they looked at his tracks and thought he'd gone in the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to logically think about that story. It doesn't work, but it's a great story, and who likes to let truth get in the way? of a good story. <laughs> Although one story that is true, and one story that I enjoy very much, because Galley Hill was the very first estate to be built under the new town land in Northern Leeds. It was the first place to be built. And so therefore, when I go up to the school up at Galley Hill, they tend to go, mm, you haven't got any story. All your stories about Stony Stratford. So I searched, I looked, and I found a story that links to Gabby Hill. And I have to say, the kids up there are now full of excitement about it, and they tell each other the story. Because this story connects 
Culverton, Stoney, and Gully Hill together. You see, there was a gentleman whose name was Simon Bennett, and he was a lovely chap. He owned the, the man farm in Calverton, and he was quite a wealthy chap. And he would regularly give to the poor on the Calverton side of Stony Stratford. For anybody within the Calverton parish, if you were poor, if you could afford something, he would be your beneficiary. He even allowed the poor folk to come onto his land, as was the tradition at the time, to pick up any fallen wood for their fires. It meant he didn't have to go and pick it up, and his land kept fresh, and they had some warmth without having to pay for it. It was a good deed. But unfortunately, for as good as he was, his wife, Grace Bennett, was mean and miserable and awful because everybody used to just call her Madam Bennett, which is how she liked to be known. Well, Madam Bennett, the moment that Simon died, she banned anybody coming onto her land, picking up wood. She kept all of the money to herself. She wouldn't even pay the local priest for his tithe. She kept that money closely guarded. And it was said that she had a cousin who was a butcher here in Stony Stratford. His name was Adam Barnes. Adam had fallen on tough times and so he went to Grace and he pleaded with her and he begged for her for some money and she said no and apparently it turned into a bit of an argument as can do with that. <laughs> he went home. Maybe he went to one of the pubs to go and drown his sorrows. We don't know. But that argument at him, turned into a rage until he took the tools of his trade, his butcher's knife, went back up to Calverton Manor in the dead of night and practiced his trade on Grace Bennett. They say there was so much blood, guts and gore that the stones were stained red. It was later found out that there was iron ore in the stones. <laughs> <laughs> Adam was arrested and he was held in the local jail until the assizes, the local court case, and they happened to take place at the Cross Keys pub, just down on the high street. And there, Adam was found guilty. He was taken up to Galley Hill, or as it was then, Gallows Hill, and he was hung by the neck until he was dead. That's about two hours. He was cut down. Now usually what would happen if you had committed a murder, your body would be cut down, you'd be taken to the prison's graveyard, which was unconsecrated ground, so therefore your soul would never rest. But the people around here thought that well, that was too good for Adam Barnes. And so his body was then put in a gibbet. That's one of those metal cages that's sort of people shaped. And so he was slumped in that whilst dead, letting the birds pick away at him until he was nothing more than bone. And where was that gibbet hanging? Well, on Gibbs Lane. That used to be Gibbet Lane. It's now Gibbs Lane, sounds much nicer, doesn't it? <laughs> but that's where it's got his name from, and he was left there until he was nothing more than white bone. And even that wasn't good enough, because then they took him out of the gibbet, they took off his skull, and they put it onto a pole. <laughs> and they planted that outside of Calverton Manor just to make sure that everybody knew what's going to happen to you if you get up to anything naughty around these parts. So now you know. <laughs> Best behave yourself. I've heard the stories. <laughs> They're all true. <laughs> Well, we know what's going to happen to you. We'll come looking for you at Gibbs Hill. Hey, Gibbs Lane. <coughs> so, yes. Poor old Grace Bennett. Maybe if she'd been a bit nicer, her story would have been a bit nicer. But, let's go for one of my favourite stories about Milton Keynes. This is a beautiful story. And it's not right here at Stony Strap, but it's just a little bit down the road in New Bradwell. And it happened early in the 1900s. And I came across this story by a chap that some of you might recognise, Horton Mundy. Now he was interviewed um, by the Living Archives and gave them a whole wealth of personal stories of his entire life.
Hawaii. And this story comes from his childhood. Him and his friends would go to school at New Bradwell. But after school finished, they would always go to the bakery, which was owned by old Scotty Edwards. Now, they weren't going there for the cakes and treats. There was something far better at the bakery because old Scotty had a parrot and this parrot talked. And for the boys that went in regularly, this parrot even learned their name. So uh, Horton had a friend called Ginger. Can't imagine why. <laughs> and this parrot, every time it saw Ginger, would go, Ginger, Ginger, Ginger. And it was, they would go and they'd have a great time talking to this parrot, probably trying to teach it rude words, mm -hmm. that's what you do with a parrot that can talk. And they loved this parrot. But old Scotty, he was exactly that, he was old, and after a few years he couldn't really keep the bakery up anymore. And so he sold it and he used that money to build himself a nice new house. They just opened up a bit of land down by the canal, and so he had this house built, and it stretched down to the canal and it had a lovely tree in the back garden. And when he moved in, he thought this tree was brilliant. He could hang Polly's cage up in the tree and she could look out over the canal. It would keep her amused all day. And so that's what he did. And down the canal, the boats went up and down and up and down. Now I should point out that at that time there were no engines. And so the boats were pulled by ponies. And the way you got them to move, you're not sticking a key in something, you try to stick a key in a pony, it would move, but you wouldn't get the reaction you wanted. So they would go, Gee! And that's what they trust the pony. Whoa! And the pony would stop. And when they were going through New Bradwell, they had to do quite a bit of this because they were coming up to a lock gate. And so the parrot heard all day long, Gee! Whoa! Gee! So the parrot learned to say G up and one. And so the pony are trotting along, pulling along the boat, and all of a sudden the parrot, wow! And suddenly the horse would hear that stop. The boaties would be furious. Oh, they'd leap out of the boat, they'd go to try and shift the horse on, at which point the parrot would go, G up! The horse would trot on and the boat would be left running after the horse and the boat. On one occasion, there was one boaty who was heard to say, When I get that bloody long day, I'm coming back here and I'm going to rip that bloody parrot's neck. Well, he didn't. But I think the boaties planned and plotted. Because a few nights after that, old Scotty Edward forgot to bring Polly in. Some say it was because the boaties went round, took him down to the navigation <laughs> and got him a bit drunk, packed him off home, and when he woke up in the morning, he realised Polly wasn't in. He ran out into his back garden, that frost crunching beneath his feet. And he got down to the bottom of the garden, and there was old Polly lying in the bottom of her cage. The night air had gotten her, and there was nothing that could be done. But Old Horton says, and this is his personal story, he tells us magic happened. Because although the parrot could not be brought back to life, people of New Bradwell attest to the fact that from that day on, as the ponies trotted down past that tree, they would stop and they would bow <laughs> at the tree in atonement for what their masters had done. And so, next time you think Milton Keynes is all concrete cows and concrete jungles, remember, magic lies here. <laughs> <laughs> bodies a little bit earlier on and I'm going to tell you a little bit more because if you wander down the high street now and you look 
in some of the shops, you'll see they've still got some of their Halloween decorations up, lots of hanging bodies I noticed the other day as I went. And it would appear that this is a tradition in Stony Stratford. There was a once called a, a pub called the King's Head in the Market Square. And going back a few centuries, it was owned by a landlady who had a son called Constable. Now, Constable apparently was a bit of a ne'er-do-well, a ruffian, a no-good, because he liked his little hobby was to go and steal sheep. But apparently he wasn't very good at it because he got caught. And so Constable was taken down to Ellsbury, and there he was tried at the Assizes, he was found guilty, and at that time, sheep stealing was such a crime, it was punishable by death. And so that's exactly what was going to happen to Constable. He was hung down in Ellsbury, his mum, the landlady from the King's Head, went down and collected his body to bring it back to Stony Stratford for burial. But it so happens that it was one of those good times, stony fairs that we like to have. And so rather than getting Constable buried straight away, she put him up in one of the bedrooms in the King's Head and charged Penny a peek during the fair for people to go, the hanged man. I don't think there must have been an awful lot of love going on there. But it does make me wonder about that epitaph that we see in the uh, graveyard in Magdalen Tower. That one about the fellow, not if he'd lived, he would have never done no good. Um, I think maybe, maybe it might have been comfortable seeing him as his mum. But the effort of bringing him back, she obviously buried him. But if she paid Penny a piece, she wasn't too impressed by him, was she? <laughs> Let's face it. Did you know that Stony Stratford had its very own witch? A real witch in Stony Stratford, just down on Horsefair Green. They say that she was as ugly as the year is long. But let's face it, if you've got a witch in the story, she has to be ugly, doesn't she? <laughs> Now, she knew all sorts of cures. Some say that she had been taught herbology by the monks down at St. Paul's, which is now uh, the Covenant of Brasley. Some say that she knew this in magical ways. We shall never know. But she did know all sorts of cures. She could cure the king's evil. She could cure black fever. She could cure smallpox. She could cure sore eyes. She could cure your coughs, your colds, your sneezes, your chills. She could cure it all. Because she knew that there was a sacred spring nearby. Just over there in Calverton. Gorick's Spring. And she would take the water from Gorick's Spring. And she would say the rhyme, and now let's see if I can remember. Uh, when Gorick's spring blows fast and clear, then stoop and drink, for help is here. If Gorick's spring ever run dry, beware, pestilence is nigh. And so she would say this rhyme as she collected the water. She would take it back to Horsefair Green and she would prepare her cure. And people would come for all sorts of things if they didn't feel well, if they wanted to fall in love, if they wanted to fall out of love. They would come to her for everything. But the years rolled on and making her way up, getting the water and bringing it back started to take its toll on her bones. And so she got an apprentice. They say that the girl that she took as an apprentice was as beautiful as she was ugly. And she started to teach the girl all these skills. She taught the girl the rhyme. She taught the girl how to go up and draw the water and to bring it back. And back with the boys, back with the boys, the girl was going. One day, the girl was at the water and she was saying the rhyme. If Gorick's spring flows fast and clear, then come on guys, stoop low and drink for health is here. And as she was saying this, suddenly 
she heard a noise and she looked up and there was a dog leading a blind gypsy boy towards the spring. And she helped him down and she gave him some water, some water she had just left in that special way. And she said, stoop now, gypsy boy, and drink this. And she gave it to him. And then she took her own red kerchief she put it into the water, and as she did, all the red dye drained out of that scar and turned it snow white. And then she took that cloth and she wiped his eyes. And the story says that the next time he opened his eyes, he could see, he gasped before he could see for the very first time in his life. And what could he see? But a beautiful girl. What a better way to <laughs> And so there he was. He saw her and instantly he fell in love and begged her to marry him. She said, well, I can't marry you. I'm, I'm under an apprenticeship. I'm learning all these cures. But she said, I will take you back to meet my mistress. And so she took the gypsy boy back to Horsfair Green. They went running into the house. She was so excited she wanted to show the old witch that now she's finally coming to her house. She could cure as well. But when she went running into the kitchen, the rocking chair was still. The old woman had passed. Or it seems that with the passing of the power, also the life had passed. And so the girl knew now that she was the witch of Stony Strap, that she was the one who had to give the cures. And so when the gypsy boy begged her again to marry, she said, no, I can't. I've got to be here for these people. So he stuck around and he helped her. And after a few years, eventually, well, she did marry him. And as the witches in Stony Stratford and Martha, well, that's another story. I think there's a few still working around. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, if I'm talking about Stony Stratford, there is one story that I haven't told, um, which is the Great Fire of Stony Stratford, 1742. And that is my media story, because really the major evidence that we have for the fact that it was a maid who did it comes from the Northampton Gazette, and it was published on the 1st of May, 1742, which says that there had been a great fire in Stony Stratford, doesn't give the exact date, but we can guess it's somewhere in that week, which coincidentally, the 1st of May was when the house burnt down on the high street in 2016. So be very careful if you're lighting candles or bonfires on the 1st of May in Stony Stratford. Just um, So, yes, they, uh, um, it was in that gazette that they chronicled the, the story of it being a maid, no maid, just that she was trying to make sure that she didn't get caught by her mistress for having scorched the sheep. And she then stuffed the sheep up the chimney. Now, I have many problems with this story. One being, if the fire was going, how could you stuff the sheep up the chimney? You would get burnt. I think the more interesting story is the one that doesn't appear in the paper. And that is fact that the Bull Hotel was one of the first buildings in Stony Stratford to get fire insurance. <laughs> they were doing particularly badly at the time in competition to the cock. I'm not saying anything. I'm just putting the facts out there. I'll let you make up the rest of that story for yourself. <laughs> and that's really where it starts to go into urban myth, I suppose. Well, Urban myth. Milton Keynes had a few. We've talked about the coffee cup, but another urban myth that I particularly enjoy. Well, that would be the one about Midsummer's Boulevard. They say that Midsummer's Boulevard, you can sit on it, you can see the sunrise, and that it connects on a ley line all the way down to Stonehenge. And they say, so uh, the story goes, that because when the planners realised this ley line connection, that they decided that the night before midsummer they would spend all night on a patch of ground which would later become the roundabout on Midsummer Boulevard, 
and there they would party and they would revel and they would enjoy the night and watch the sun rise and then the next day they would go back and they would plan exactly where that street would be well maybe they partied too much because whether or not you believe in ley lines, the one thing is true. It doesn't actually correlate to the sun rising. It's about eight degrees off. So there is a slight urban myth going on there about them being young men all up and hedonistic and ready to party. But some of those stories I have been told by some of them that were there are true. But that one, they say, isn't. <laughs> Who wants to read over the history? Is um, Derek Walker. Derek Walker was uh, quite a part of the Development Corporation. He was quite high up the rung. He was instrumental in developing uh, the city centre. But it was also his job to help get all the models ready to go and be taken down to Haymarket for the London exhibition to encourage people to come and move to Milton Keynes. And they were getting everything ready, and he had this beautiful silver model of the sewage works. And it was the only model that was finished by the time the exhibition was coming around. And so Derek took it down and they put it in place, and one of the technicians looked at it and said, What was that? He said, It's the sewage works. And he said, Is it the only model you've got of the sewage works? Yes, it is. Well, it's lovely and all that, but really, that might not be the best way to encourage people to come to Milton Keynes. Now, close your ears, because I am going to quote him accurately. This is for over again. Derek Walker apparently turned around and said, Yes, well, if we do this for shit, imagine what we'll do for people. <laughs> Upon hearing that, uh, Jock Campbell, who was the head of the Development Corporation, phoned him up because he was still here at Milton Keynes and went, Derek, you can't say that to the public. <laughs> and overnight they managed to get a few more models made and taken down and everything was fine. But I like to imagine that in those early days, if you turned up to the exhibition, that is what you would have seen. <laughs> Maybe that's why we have such a bad reputation here in Milton Keynes. Maybe that's what all them out there think of us because that's all they saw. Who knows? But the greatest urban myth that I feel I have discovered is the fact of the bad reputation. Because no matter how hard I search, when I go out in amongst the people of Milton Keynes with my questionnaires and my interviews and my feedback forms, and I talk to them about their sense of place and whether they feel Milton Keynes has a bad reputation. Well, generally what keeps happening is people go, well, I don't have a bad uh, image of Milton Keynes. I really enjoy Milton Keynes. But have you spoken to the people in that group square? I bet they have got a <laughs> bad, bad image of Milton Keynes. So I said, oh, okay, thank you very much. So I go over to this group square, I start interviewing people and say, so do uh, you have a bad sense of place? No, we don't. We love Milton Keynes. It's great. You think everybody here is fantastic. But if people are there, they'll have a really bad sense of place. Do you have a bad sense of place? And then you go from place to place to place to place. And although it's true that only one person turned up in Connemara, that one person <laughs> loved it. She said it's actually really nice. People have a really bad image of Connemara, but it's really and so I started to think to myself, hang on a minute. Nobody here seems to have a bad sense of place. And yet even the county council state on their website for arts and heritage that people of Milton Keynes have a poor sense of place. So where does this myth come from? It's certainly not there in the research. I've even looked for disparaging stories about Milton Keynes, even in the media. And even in the media they go, Milton Keynes is a terrible place and has no cultural heritage. I 
based my whole PhD on it. And when, two years later, I gather all my data together, I realised I was wrong. And I hope that over the last 55 minutes, I might have convinced a few of you to look at my conclusions in a new light. I'm going to do is one love story, one that I wrote for my sister. Once upon a time, there were too many people and not enough houses. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? And so the government decided that they were going to build new towns. And the biggest, the last, and the best of them all, they named Milton Keynes. People migrated here from all over the country, all over the world, in their thousands. The people were new, the houses were new, everything was new, and Milton Keynes sparkled in its newness. But then the other towns and villages, they started to get jealous, they started to laugh at Milton Keynes. They said, because you're new, you've got no heritage. And they started to tell jokes. And Milton Keynes started to feel a bit bad. But when it turned 50, it thought, now I'm 50 years old, people can't say I'm new anymore. Surely they will like me better. And yet the jokes still stayed. By chance, a passing storyteller came past. And she heard the locals telling these terrible jokes. But when she looked, she suddenly saw that there was stories peeking out all over the place. And so she gathered them up. She went on a quest to find histories and folk tales, stories of witches and highwaymen, kings and queens. And she gathered this whole array of stories up. And then she went to the people of Milton Keynes and she gave them back. Because then now, the people of Milton Keynes became the storytellers, telling their own stories. For they knew that the difference between Milton Keynes and a pot of yogurt is that Milton Keynes had stories and therefore heritage. <laughs>